and Mrs. Knorr, starring Barbara Britton and Richard Denning. She just came up out of nowhere. I saw the whole thing. It wasn't your fault. Lie still. There's an ambulance coming. I'm all right. We know, but we won't take any chances. Everything's going to be all right. The ambulance will be here in a couple of minutes. Uh, may I please have your name and address, ma'am? Carrie Foster. I live at the Martin Hotel on 35th Street. May I have yours, sir? Mr. and Mrs. Gerald North, 23, St. Anne's Place. Is there anything I can do, officer? Nothing now. When she gets to the hospital, I'm putting a hold on her until the precinct can check on my report. Is there any special reason why? Yeah. Suspicion that attempted suicide. I saw her run in front of your car. this thing in tonight's paper about Carrie Foster? Mm. Why don't you sit down? I'll bring you a the nice... hired companion questioned in death of former film star. Look, they've even got a picture over here. Yes, I've seen it. Um, here. The coroner's jury today brought in an open verdict in the case of the strange death of Adele Dahlgren, 58, one of the reigning beauties of the silent film era. Her death was attributed to an overdose of sleeping pills, Want but the circumstances... You know I don't smoke a pipe. Hey, what's the matter with you tonight? Uh, well, there's something I want to talk to you about. Yeah, all right. Well, just a minute. Carrie Foster, for many years, Miss Dargham's paid companion, underwent intensive questioning, but insisted that she had no knowledge of uh, the Jerry. circumstances. And that... what is it? Can't you see I'm trying to... I hope these are the way you like them, Mr. North. Oh, they're just lovely, Carrie. Thank you. Let's have it. I tried to tell you, but you wouldn't listen. Well, I'm listening now. What's she doing here? Well, it's my fault. I called and asked Carrie to come and see me when she left the hospital this afternoon. Oh, darling, she hasn't any money. She's out of work, and she can't get another job until this commotion dies down. There isn't even a friend to whom she can turn in the meantime. I see. Well, what did you tell her? Well, I assured her that I... That we're her friends and she can stay here until the sensation seekers get excited about some other newspaper headlines. Anyway, now she knows that suicide is no answer. Mm. Well, what's she doing in that outfit? Oh, Carrie insisted. She, she said she wouldn't stay here unless she could earn her keep. So I gave in. You angry? No, darling, of course not. It's just that... Well, I wonder, she, living in the same apartment with a, with a front-page story can be complicated. Oh, Pooh. Wait till you taste the dinner Carrie's cooked. That'll bring the roses to your haggard, careworn cheeks. Yeah? Well, all right, then. What a... oh, I, I'll get it, Carrie. Oh, yes? Mr. North? I'm Jim Edson of the Glow. May I come in? Oh, a reporter. Oh, we were just about to have dinner. Well, I take a my... moment, Mr. North. Hey, just a minute. Well, Miss Foster, remember me, Jim Edson, columnist in the Globe? How did you find me here? Trade secret. It wasn't easy. All right, Edson, what's on your mind? I just came by to give Miss Foster a sort of preview. 
I just finished interviewing a returning traveler, one Whitney Dahlgren, age 41, only son and heir of the late Adele Dahlgren. Whitney Dahlgren? But we've never met. He always lived in Europe. He's back here now. And as you all may read in tomorrow's column, Whitney fears his mother met with foul play, quote, unquote. Is that your quote or Mr. Dahlgren's? Well, I don't make the news. I merely report it. Yeah, and if things get dull, you don't mind stirring them up, huh? <laughs> How about it, Miss Foster? Care to issue a statement? A statement? Sure. How and why you did it. Your life with Adele Dahlgren. Print it up with a nice batch of photographs. Promise you a nice piece of change. Get out. Oh, just a minute, North. You want me to throw you out? You think you're man enough for the job? Let's try it. Okay. Hey! Ball of nerve. Thank you, Mr. North. What are you doing? You're not going to have any more trouble because of me. Now, just a minute. You're staying right here as our guest or as our cook, whichever you prefer, but you're not leaving. But I can't. No cheap tabloid reporter is going to run you out of my house, and that's fine. Mrs. North, tell him that I... Oh, I can't tell him anything when he's in this mood, Carrie. You'd better do just as he says. I'll bring in the dinner. <laughs> that's because you're a very nice fellow, Mr. North. Hey, these are wonderful. Whitney Dahlgren? I am. And you? You're Mr. Strauss, mother's attorney. Come in, please. I've been waiting for you. I'll take that. Won't you come in and sit down? Thank you. May I offer you a cigar? Oh, thank you. I'll smoke it after dinner. Be my guest. Since you've been away from the country and your mother for over 10 years, there are a great many details you should know. <laughs> Forget the details. How much do I get? Briefly, in as few words as possible. Right. Briefly, then, you're broke. What did you say? I said you're broke. Bankrupt. Without funds. What are you trying to do? Pull some kind of racket? If you wish to hire a competent accountant... The old girl was loaded. Where did it all go? By complying with your regular and exorbitant financial demands, your mother finally brought herself to the point where she died penniless and in debt. I'm not asking for a lecture. I don't believe you anyway. Nevertheless, it's true. The insurance. She always carried a large policy. That is true. There is a policy for $50,000. You are named as beneficiary. Well, why didn't you say so? One moment. The insurance company has refused to pay off, and it is highly doubtful if they ever will. Why? What kind of swindle is this? In the event of death by suicide, and there is a strong presumption your mother took her own life, the policy is automatically void. But who said she killed herself? Who? It would be difficult to prove otherwise, despite the innuendos of one of our leading tabloids. The necklace. The Dahlgren diamond. She never parted with that. Where is it? Ah. Uh, that's the baby. Not quite. They're paste. Paste? You mean to tell me these aren't the Dahlgren diamonds? I'm sorry. At some time, exactly when, I don't know. Your mother disposed of the original jewels and replaced them with this inexpensive replica. I'm overdue for dinner. Stop in at my office tomorrow morning. There are a few formalities. I'm rather curious. What do you intend to do? Do? What do you mean? Well, to my knowledge, you've never had a job. Never equipped yourself for anything. Going to work for the first time at your... Oh, get out! Good night.
Mr. Dalton. Oh, I don't want any. <clears throat> you looking for trouble? Could be. That's good. I've got lots of it. Help yourself. <laughs> okay. How about a couple of samples? Money gone? No insurance on account of suicide? Dalgren diamonds? <laughs> <coughs> what about the diamonds? <laughs> That's a big joke. They're gone, too. They're gone? No. Yeah. Just those phonies left. No money. Listen to me. Oh, you're too drunk to know what I'm talking about. So I'm drunk. You want to make something of it? Okay, okay. I apologize. No. Who the devil are you, anyway? Edson. I write a column for the Globe. We met at the airport, remember? Mm. Oh. Well, what's on your mind? I think you and I can do each other quite a bit of good, Mr. Dalgren. First of all, what do you know about Carrie Foster? Carrie Foster? Foster? Who's she? Your mother's companion at the time of her death. Mm. I've had a wild hunch about this. Now with the Dahlgren diamonds turning out pace, the whole thing adds up. Your mother was murdered, probably because she found out about those not being real. What did you say? Now, listen to me carefully. I went back to the paper and I checked our files. Now I want to tell you about Carrie Foster, a sweet little old murderess. Oh, Jerry, what are we going to do? Carrie still doesn't have any money and no place to go. Let's throw on some clothes and go after her. At this time of night, she shouldn't be too hard to find. Take it easy. Nobody's drunk and nobody's hurt. You missed my front fender by that much. I missed it, didn't I? What are you so nervous about? Oh, with guys like you driving, I got a right to be nervous. Hey, wait a minute, lady. What are you doing with my fare? Oh, we're taking her home with us. She won't need the cab. How do you like that? How do you like that? What's a guy like me supposed to do to make a living in this racket? Here, will this preserve your professional standing? Oh, yeah, I guess so. Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. Hold it. Supposing a woman don't want to go with you. Maybe this is a snatch. Maybe I should call a cop. Why don't you do that? It's all right, driver. I'm sorry I caused you so much trouble. All right, now, Carrie, sit down. And remember, dear, we're your friends. We want to help you if we can. I have no right to impose on you. You've been wonderful, but... But what? There's something about me you should know. Something I should have told you. You don't have to tell us anything, Gary. I've got to, Mr. North. Then maybe you'll see why it'll be better for you if I go now. Some years ago, well, before I worked for Adele Dahlgren, I worked as a companion for an old lady, an invalid. Her name was Mrs. Corey, and she lived in a little house just outside of Bridgeport. She, well, one night she was found dead. Well, that's a terrible thing, but 
I, I don't see how that... But don't you understand? Sooner or later, someone, possibly that reporter, is going to find out about Mrs. Corey. They're going to say that it isn't coincidence that people I work for die under peculiar circumstances. They'll call it a pattern. You've both been wonderful. I'll be all right now. Now, wait a minute. You haven't done anything wrong. And we're going to see to it that nobody pushes you around. But that newspaper, they'll, they'll smear your name all over the front page. Oh, hang the newspaper. We'll worry about that when we come to it. I'll keep ringing. This is urgent. Sleeping. Well, this should wake you up, Mr. Dahlgren. Seems you may be able to collect on an insurance policy of your mother's after all. I told you I don't want to. He hints the diamonds were a motive for murder. I, I'm coming right down to your office. Come in, come in. My friend, the press. It was a great story. Can I get you a drink? Uh, thanks, but I think you better hear what Mr. Costa has to say before we start to celebrate. Mr. Costa? That's me. Mr. Costa is a jeweler and one of my constant readers who phoned me early this morning to let me know of a slight error in today's piece. Go ahead. This is Mrs. Dahlgren's son. About three years ago, Mr. Dahlgren, your mother came to my shop. She gave me the Dahlgren diamonds to sell. I did so, acting as her agent. She also commissioned me to make for her an imitation necklace, worth perhaps a few hundred dollars. This I did. That is the true story. Thanks, Mr. Coster. I'll be in touch with you. Uh, do you wish me to make a statement? Oh, later. I'll take care of it. Good day to you, Mr. Dahlgren. Boy, when I make a mistake, it's a beaut. Just think of that. Your mother dies under mysterious circumstances. Somebody very close to her snaffles her diamonds. I find a police report that her companion tried suicide right after the inquest. Would you mind telling me what all that adds up to? Shut up. All adds up to murder with a clear-cut motive and an obvious attempt to avoid punishment? Only it wasn't that at all. Edson, I said shut up. Huh? If Carrie Foster had succeeded in her suicide attempt, she would have been branded a murderess. Well, sure, I just finished telling you that. What's the... Well, I guess that's as close as I'll ever come to collecting on my mother's insurance. Still, I, uh, I would like to have a chance to make all this up to Carrie, to let her know that I'm sorry she was given a bad time. No, I guess that's understandable. A retraction in the paper isn't going to make you look very smart, is it? What are you driving at? Well, I just thought that it might be better all around if I had a chance to straighten this out quietly. Well, sure, that'll be a break for me, all right. But what about Coster? He's expecting to read a retraction in my column. I'll take care of Coster. I think I can convince him it's the best out for all concerned to just let the whole matter die. Okay, it's worth a try, Whitney. Personally, I read Coster as one of those good citizens who'll hold out for a public statement from us. We'll see. I've got to get down to the attorney's office. I'll see mm. you later. Mr. Dahlgren. Yep. Well, you locked my door, Mr. Dahlgren. Why? Just say I like privacy. Why, I can't have my door locked. I'm in business. My customers won't know it to think. Yes, this is Carrie Foster. Yes. 
Yes. What? What was that? So, uh, Miss Foster, if you will meet me and Mr. Coster at the attorney's office, we can clear your name at once. Excellent. I, we, we'll be uh, waiting for you at Mr. Strauss's office. Yes. This is your popular music station, WWO, and now we bring you five minutes of the latest news. Hey, Pam, kill that thing, will you? Kill what thing? The radio. I can stand music while I'm working, but that voice of doom newscast right. is another matter. Police are investigating the brutal slaying of Jerome Coster, whose mutilated body was discovered within the hour. More work for poor Bill Wigan and the police. Yeah. Jerome Coster? Coster. And Senator Honeycutt stated this morning that he would call his committee into immediate session. Oh, no, we missed it. He did say Jerome Coster had been murdered. And Carrie told us that Jerome Coster was to be at that, that uh, lawyer's office to meet with her and Whitney Dahlgren. Oh, what was the name of... Strauss. What are you thinking, Jerry? We'd better get down to Mr. Strauss's office and see what's going on. I don't see how a dead man can clear Carrie's name. before you got to Strauss's office. You're in trouble, Miss Foster. Trouble? But uh, I thought you said that everything... I was wrong. This is a trap. When you go into that office, you'll find the police there waiting to arrest you. Come this way. I'm trying to help you. But I don't understand, Mr. Dalton. The jeweler is waiting to identify you as the party for whom he made the paste replica of my mother's necklace. He'll try you for murder, and you'll be convicted. But that's ridiculous. I didn't kill your mother. And I don't know anything about her necklace or the jeweler. The police won't believe you. Remember, you tried to commit suicide. Then there was that other woman you worked for who died. Take me to the office. We'll see what they believe. All right. But remember, I tried to warn you. Strauss's office must be down this way. Come on. Money, the diamonds, nothing left, nothing. What'll I do? What can I do? Stop moaning, Dorbin. You've got it made. Three meals a day, a roof over your head, and if you're lucky, a view of the river. From now on, the people of the state of New York are going to take care of your future. Come on. I know you're going to miss her cooking. Oh, cakes. Are... Yeah. Your valise is in the cab, Carrie. I'm ready. But I do hope your friend, Mr. Stewart, will be satisfied with my work. Well, Jack Stewart's a darn good writer and one of my favorite people. And he certainly needs a good housekeeper. But remember, I warned you. I know. He's an old bachelor and a terrible wolf. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd better hurry. <laughs> Goodbye, Carrie. <laughs> Women are the... Yes, dear? You were saying? The most wonderful.
and Mrs. North is directed by Ralph Francis Murphy. A John W. Loveton production. Produced by Federal Telefilms. Starring Barbara Britton and Richard Denning, featuring Francis DeSales. This has been a film presentation.